All right. Hello and welcome to the NNP Symposium. I'm hoping the audio is coming through correctly. We are still, this is the first one of the day, so bear with us. Um, so for everyone watching at home, if you've been to an NNP Symposium before, you should be familiar with how we run things. It should look pretty much exactly the same. Uh, for those of you here in person, we are live streaming all of these talks <laughs> via Zoom as well. Um, so we have people watching online who are also tuning in. So uh, we are going to get started with our first presentation, which is Ellen Ansi and David Byers talking about the National Parks quarters um, and how the designs were selected for them. So uh, let's, I need to change how this present this, how, are, how things are displayed. There we go. Okay. Give me one moment. Well, okay. There we go. Okay. Um, then David and Ellen, can you all just say hi for a moment so I can be sure that the audio is coming through? Uh, sure. Uh, good morning, everybody. All right. Did you hear awesome. me okay? Then let's see. We need it's coming Ellen, through on did you Zoom. Want to give that a try too? Not coming through on our speaker. Please hold. <laughs> can you okay. hear me? Yes. Radio. I can hear you. Nope. Bluetooth. Okay. Say hi again. Hello. Good morning. Awesome. We're going. Okay. Okay. We'll go ahead and get started. I'll let you two take it away, and I'll be back at the end for the Q and A. Awesome. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here uh, with the uh, the um, uh, opening presentation at the Newman News Numismatics uh, uh, Symposium. Uh, and really always great to have an opportunity to talk about one of our favorite topics, the America the Beautiful Quarter Series, and uh, especially the quarter uh, uh, presented for Lowell National Historical Park. So we'll uh, um, introduce ourselves uh, first here. So Ellen, do you want to go first? Sure. Good morning. I'm Ellen Anstey. I'm the manager for administration and engagement at the Songus Industrial History Center. Our center is a hands-on experiential learning center um, where we have school field trips and a lot of teacher workshops. Um, we're a partnership between Lowell National Historical Park and the University of Massachusetts Lowell. Dave? And uh, I'm Dave Byers. I'm a, a supervisory park ranger, work for the National Park Service. Uh, right now I'm at Ford's Theater in the National Mall and Memorial Parks. Uh, been here for a couple of years, but I had the good fortune for uh, eight years to work at Lowell National Historical Park. I'm from Massachusetts. Um, and uh, I got to work as the, the liaison to the U.S. men for the Lowell Quarter uh, Project uh, just a couple of years ago before coming down here to Washington, D.C. So uh, that is uh, us. Uh, our topic today is uh, called a, a pocket full of parks. Uh, and we're gonna talk a little bit about the America the Beautiful quarter uh, series centered around the national parks. Uh, talk a little bit about the, uh, the program itself. Many of you will be familiar with that. So it might be a bit of a review, but for those of you that aren't an introduction to that program and how it came to be, we'll talk about some of the challenges and the controversies that surround some of the selections of the sites, uh, the, the specific national parks that are on the quarters, uh, a little bit about the design choices. Uh, and then a whole lot of our story is going to be centered around a park that we know very well, and that is uh, Lowell National Historical Park. Uh, it's the, the one that Ellen and I uh, partnered uh, with the Mint on in, uh, in launching the, the Lowell National Park uh, quarter. Uh, that, um, uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with Lowell National Historical Park, it's about 35 miles northwest of Boston. Uh, it is a park established in 1978 to tell the story of the American Industrial Revolution, uh, Revolution uh, and uh, the uh, flowing together of uh, technology and new forms of work. Uh, one of the famous stories associated with Lowell is the Lowell Mill Girls, uh, the daughters of farmers from northern New England coming down to work in the mills and for the first time earning a cash wage, really a kind of revolution in uh, uh, the, the female workforce and, uh, uh, and, and women's roles in society. Uh, a lot of advocacy around uh, women's rights that, that grows out of uh, their working experience here in the mills, but then also the story of immigrants that would come later and uh, work in the mills and create a tremendously diverse uh, workforce and city. Lowell was one of the most diverse places outside of New York City uh, in the late 19th century, and still that is one of the defining features of both the city uh, and the park that we have there today. So it is a great place to visit 
Uh, it was powered by the canals that ran through the city, uh, 5.6 miles of the, those canals that we do tours on today. So uh, a very diverse park, a lot of interesting stories to, to tell, uh, and a real challenge when it comes to, to representing those stories on the, uh, on the quarter. Uh, so uh, to get um, uh, get started, uh, many of you, I, I'm sure, know uh, about the, the United States Mint. Uh, the Mint is established in 1792 to mint our, our coinage. Uh, and they were, of course, our great uh, partners in uh, the, uh, the quarter series and uh, launching the uh, quarter on the world. And they were just fantastic to work with. I, I really had a, a tremendously uh, a great experience uh, working with our, our partners and our representatives there. Uh, as many of you know, uh, quarters have a long uh, history. Uh, they were not minted at first when the mint was first started, but soon thereafter, uh, the, uh, in 1796, the first quarter comes out. We have the draped bust. We have the capped bust a little bit later. I particularly like this quarter because thinking about those low mill girls, earning that cash wage, this is the quarter that's probably in their pocket uh, that, they're, that they're taking home. And just the pride that comes along with having that as something that they've earned themselves that they're able to go out and, uh, and make purchases with. But, uh, and then we have the uh, seated Liberty. We have the Liberty Head, the Barber Quarter. We have the Standing Liberty. Uh, but of course, probably the most familiar quarter to most people in the public today are the Washington Quarters. Minted starting in 1932, the bicentennial of George Washington's birth, uh, with the uh, reverse, the eagle, and uh, the very familiar uh, arrows and uh, olive branches uh, below. Uh, and that is the design relatively unchanged for just about its uh, whole run, with one exception that I'm sure many of you know about, and that is in 1976 for the bicentennial, uh, there is uh, this design that is on the reverse in the quarter. It always amazes me how many of these I still run across in, in change, uh, given the number of people, the number of them that are pulled out of circulation. Everyone I run across, I, I keep and set aside there. But tremendously successful uh, design on the back of the quarter, and just a great idea to think about featuring uh, some different aspect of American life on the back of that quarter. Uh, so fast forward uh, 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 a couple of decades later, and partly rooted in the success of this 1976 bicentennial quarter, uh, a new idea comes about for uh, new reverses on the, uh, on the quarter. And so with that, I'll have uh, Ellen uh, take us away into our next section. Yep. So, so as early as 1993, there were members of the Citizen Commemorative Coin Advisory Committee that were advocating for a state quarter system. Um, and all new coin design has to go through um, Congress. So they hooked up with Representative Mike Castle from Delaware. And he was skeptical at first that this would really be a successful um, coin project. But when he realized that the state's where quarters would be released in the order that states became states, that would mean Delaware would be first. So he jumped on board, got the legislation to go through, and um, the state quarters started in 1999 with Delaware as the first state, and that's Caesar Rodney on the horse there. And um, the state quarter program ran from 1999, coins issued every 10 weeks, and it ran all the way through 2008, um, and then extended to Washington, D.C. and territories in 2009. Um, it was very successful for the Mint um, because a lot of people collected these coins and it was introduced coin collection to a whole new generation of coin collectors. Um, early projections suggested that perhaps the Mint would make a profit of about $3 billion um, from coins being taken out of circulation by collectors. But by 2009, I'm sorry, 2018, Estimates of profits hover around 6.3 billion, plus about 136 million in profits from numismatic products that got created from these coin designs. And a lot of different uh, designs that come out of the state quarters. I know I collect them myself. I think I think about half of the population ends up uh, uh, ends up collecting those quarters. One of the ones that is uh, interesting to me and one of my favorites is the uh, quarter for New Hampshire. Uh, for those of you from the Northeast, you'll, you'll, this is a very recognizable landmark. Some of you might not be familiar with it. This is the old man of the mountain uh, up in the White Mountains. Uh, Daniel Webster wrote about it in the 1830s to say that here it is a sign from the Almighty that here he makes he makes men. 
uh, just like a cobbler might hang out a, be a big shoe or you know something like that. Uh, so it is uh, it is granite. New Hampshire is the granite state. Uh, many people you know have gone here for vacation. It's very recognizable. It's the state emblem from the 1940s. It's on the license plates. Uh, it is perfect, and it becomes the, the um, emblem of the state uh, quarter. It comes out in 2000. Uh, in 2003, sadly, the old man of the mountain becomes the old man off the mountain. So it crumbles. It had been held in place by lots of metal, metal cables for decades uh, and then falls down into Profile Lake that is uh, right underneath it. So old man of the mountain is no more. And I think this is interesting because it suggests one of the interesting aspects of creating coinage is that their meanings change, right? So when this first comes out, it is a celebration of this vacation destination, this very well-known uh, landmark. But now after it's fallen, it is almost a memorial coin, right? To something that used to be. Uh, and uh, uh, people can you know, think, think nostalgically about uh, the old man of the mountain looking at that quarter now whenever they run across it. So interesting to think about how this quarter meant something when it first came out. And then tr that meaning is, is transformed when the uh, profile crumbles into the, into the lake there. And it's something to think about as, uh, as uh, designs are being put together is what future meanings might people uh, uh, ascribe to these uh, quarters. Also, one of the challenges in putting something on the coin that is important and symbolic that may not be permanent, things in the landscape or memorials or buildings, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, just you know, one of the really interesting um, aspects to think about in, in the design process there. So as the state quarter uh, so, program, yes, yeah. as the state quarter program was ending, um, guess who's still in Congress? Our friend Mike Castle. And he was known as the coinage congressman because he worked on a lot of different coin legislation to make new designs, um, not just for circulating coins, but for um, lots of commemorative coins. And so he authored the America, the Beautiful National Parks Quarter Act of two, 2008. Um, this was going to be a whole new coin series of 56 quarters. That would be one federally managed site from each state, the territories, and of course, Washington, DC. Um, because Delaware did not have a National Park Service site, it became that it would be one federally controlled site in each state. Um, so that's a key thing is that it was federally owned and managed sites. So you'll see National Wildlife Refuge being represented on the quarters, not just national park sites. This ends up creating a little bit of a controversy when it comes up to some of the it comes to some of the, the site selections. Uh, the way the legislation is uh, is written, the site selection is technically made by the Secretary of the Treasury in consultation with the Secretary of the Interior and the governor or chief executive of whichever state or, or territory is, is relevant. Um, although the Secretary of the Treasury ultimately has the uh, is, is the decider, functionally, all of these choices were made by the governors of the states. And the governors went about choosing uh, choosing the, the sites in different ways. Uh, so, you know, blue ribbon panel, a uh, big committee. Uh, many of the, the states went and, uh, and, and did a kind of online poll and try to figure out you know, what, what would the uh, people like to see there. Uh, so some interesting results and some, some uh, challenges that came about, as uh, uh, Ellen said, uh, states try to comply with the legislation of choosing a federally managed site. One of the uh, uh, controversies that comes up is around the Oklahoma uh, National Park uh, quarter. Uh, the uh, then governor, Brad Henry, uh, makes the determination that of the very, a very few number of federally managed sites in Oklahoma, the one they would like to designate for the quarter is the Oklahoma City National Memorial. Many of you know this is the memorial put up to honor the victims, the survivors, and the, uh, the first responders and rescue workers that responded to the bombing of the Alfred Murrah uh, Federal Building in 1995. This memorial opens in 2000. It is created in partnership with the National National Park Service and it opens as a National Park Service site. Uh, but after this was chosen, and particularly Governor Henry was interested in focusing on the, uh, the survivor tree, thought that would make a really great design on the back of the quarter. Uh, a little reminiscent of the Charter Oak that appears on the back of the, uh, the, the Connecticut State Quarter. Uh, but after this was uh, uh, de determined, the United States Mint got in touch with the governor to say, hey, 
uh, that's not actually a federally managed site. The site had been transferred from the National Park Service in 2004, and now it was an NPS affiliated site, but not federally managed, not federally owned, so thus ineligible for the America the Beautiful quarter series. The uh, governor did not um, uh, come up with an alternate uh, selection. There was a great hue and cry from the uh, National Memorial Foundation. Uh, a lot of very people very upset uh, and outright hostile in interviews um, online, uh, but it did not comply with the legislation. So the United States Mint ends up making another choice, and that is the Chickasaw National Recreation Area. Uh, you know, and, uh, a, a great choice in its own right with a, a cool design, the Lincoln Bridge that it was put up in 1909 to honor the the centennial of Lincoln's birth, but was not the first choice of uh, the, the state of Oklahoma. Just one of the kind of controversies that comes up in site selection, but a more challenging one comes up with regard to a place that we know well. So the Massachusetts quarter. So again, the governor was deciding um, which federal site should be represented. And the governor at uh, Massachusetts at the time was Deval Patrick. Um, he put up a website and let people vote and the public voted. And this was where my involvement came into this project. Um, there were 245,000 online votes cast. If I knew you at the time, I said to you, go online and vote for Lowell National Historical Park to be represented on the quarter. Everyone I knew was getting emails and phone calls. And I told everybody, vote for Lowell, vote for Lowell. Um, you could vote as many times as you wanted during a day. And so every so often I'd go on and make a few more clicks. And I thought, we've got this. But then what happened? The results came out and the votes of our new quarter are in, the governor's office said, congratulations to the Gloucester Fisherman Memorial. And my immediate thought was, wait a minute, that's not a federal site. And I thought, what do I do? What do I do? Do I let someone know? And I was all nervous, but of course the Mint took care of everything on their own and even though there was much rejoicing in Gloucester, they had quarters already printed up, big cardboard quarters for their 4th of July parade. Everyone in Gloucester was so excited that this was going to bring lots of tourism to their, their city in Massachusetts. And they were very excited about it. But the Mint took care of everything and they went back to um, the governor's office and they said, sorry, the Gloucester Fisherman Memorial is a city site and not a federally owned site. So, people in Gloucester were terribly upset. There were bloggers that were writing, there were editorials made, there were petitions that tried to get started, but of course it did not meet the legislation that this had to be a federal site. So they went and Lowell was the second place winner in the online voting. So Lowell got to be um, on the quarter, Lowell National Historical Park. And it wasn't really much at this point that a lot of people knew about. Um, I knew about it and I was so excited, but now I had to wait a long time because the quarters in the um, America the Beautiful Quarter series come out as each in the order of the ways that these um, federal sites became federal sites. So Lowell National Historical Park established in 1978 was on the upper end of quarters coming out. We were the 46th of 56 quarters to be released. So I had to wait a long time for this. So coinable design is always a challenge. Uh, the designs on our coins and medals are more than drawings. They express the values and aspirations and shared heritage of our nation. Um, a couple of things that the designs should be, they should be designs that are appropriate and intriguing and make people want to learn more. They should be artistic and informational. Um, a big thing with the Mint is to be an educational institution and inspiring that next generation of coin collectors. So we wanna get people interested in a variety of coins that are aesthetically pleasing, historically accurate, and maybe we wanna avoid some controversies. Um, the legislation says that dignified designs of which citizens of the United States should be, should be proud and not frivolous and inappropriate. And to give you an idea of the, the very tall order that that is for the designers, uh, first to not be frivolous and inappropriate, uh, but also in terms of the national parks to convey the uh, tremendous uh, breadth and diversity of the national park sites. Uh, because the, the designs that are being chosen, sure, there's one park in each uh, state that is being represented, but this 
all together, this series is representing the whole breadth of the national park system. Uh, you know, it has been called America's best idea. Uh, and it is, there are more than 400 parks and they're, they're tremendously diverse. So to sort of convey a sense of the, the range of that from the Hawaii volcanoes to uh, the rugged rocky coasts of Maine, including the, the, the great lighthouse that's, uh, that, that is out there. Uh, from the, uh, the massive granite, um, uh, mountains and valleys of, of the Yosemite Valley and Yosemite National Park to, of course, the sublime beauty of the, the Grand Canyon, tremendous range of natural landscapes to convey, but also uh, plant life and wildlife and natural features, things like the oldest trees on earth, the bristlecone pines of Great Basin, the uh, Old Faithful, the geyser at Yellowstone, uh, another great vacation de destination that many people will uh, will recognize, the tremendous biodiversity from the El Yonke, uh, 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 forest um, in uh, in Puerto Rico, uh, and then of course the tall grass prairies of Kansas and so much of the Midwest that are such a defining feature of that landscape. But it's not just the natural stories; it's also the history, the ancestral Puebloan people that uh, created the monumental architecture and Chaco culture, the the colonial story of the uh, Spanish settlers there in the, uh, San Antonio and the San Antonio missions, the generations of immigrants that would come into Ellis Island and help define what the late 19th century and 20th century America would, would be. The story of our great national conflict that divides a nation over the issue of slavery and the starts of that in places like Harper's Ferry. Uh, and then the great cultural inheritance that we have here, new forms of American art in places like Weir Farm in Connecticut. And then the very idea of preservation and conservation itself, celebrated as a main theme at the Marsh Billings Rockefeller site up in Vermont, uh, 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 talking about the idea of conserving all of these places for the future uh, generations. So it's a tremendous range of stories to convey from uh, the natural and the historical to the cultural. It's a lot of work for those small quarters to be doing. Uh, and they all small are small. Uh, it is just about the smallest canvas you can imagine. There is our quarter. And I guarantee wherever you're looking at this, this is much larger than it is uh, in, in actual actuality. Uh, and many of you will know this too. It is 0.955 inches across. So tremendously small canvas to, uh, to share America's best idea uh, uh, with the American public. Just to give you some idea of what that might look like, uh, let's take a look at some really famous pieces of art. Many of you will recognize this. This is Vincent van Gogh's uh, Starry Night. Uh, but if we were to take the size of a quarter and put it against this uh, canvas that conveys so much, there we are, right? So it is just a star in Vincent van Gogh's uh, constellation. Imagine trying to convey all that that imagery conveys in, in a tiny fraction of the space. Uh, many uh, landscapes uh, are uh, conveyed on the quarters. Here's a great one by Thomas Cole, the oxbow of the Connecticut River from Mount Holyoke. And there's the size of the, the uh, uh, quarter. Uh, it is little more than uh, the size of a little raft coming along the, uh, the, the river. Uh, and one more uh, conveying the human story. So here is Grant Wood's uh, American Gothic. Uh, and if we were to take the size of the quarter, there it is. Yeah, so just like a little marshmallow on the top of the, uh, the pitchfork. So the point is, uh, it is a pretty small space to convey the complexity and diversity of all of the park stories. And it's done all in one color and relying just on the relief to uh, differentiate the different elements of the, uh, of the design. It is a tremendously tall order uh, for the designers. And I have such a tremendous respect for uh, the, the designers in the work that they do in figuring out something that would convey uh, all of these ideas really well would still be um, coinable and look good technically on the on the coin. So uh, who are these designers? And for that, I'll turn it over to Ellen. Yep. So I, so I also have tremendous respect for all of these designers. Um, the designers are part of the American, I'm um, sorry, the artistic infusion program um, that the Mint runs. It's a pool of talented American artists who enrich and invigorate our nation's coins and medals through the development of specialized designs. Um, most of them are contracted by the Mint. Um, the Mint does have full-time sculptors and probably some designers, but a lot of these folks are contracted by the Mint and they submit designs based on um, materials that for this series, they're based on materials that each of the sites sent them. I know from Lowell, we sent them lots of different materials. 
We sent them some of our teacher curriculum materials created here at the Songus Industrial History Center. Um, we sent them maps and photos and our National Park Handbook and our Junior Ranger Activity Book, um, and also foundation documents, an overview of the National Park here, just to give them an idea of what was important to us and our story. So who decides then what these designs will be? It's a whole series of people. Um, there's the Citizen Coinage Advisory Council, the Commission of Fine Arts, um, the governor of the relevant state or territory can weigh in, the National Park Service director could weigh in. Um, of course, the representatives from each site as we sent the materials and we had lots of different phone calls with um, representatives from the Mint and even um, on the call a lot of times were the artists listening in on what we thought was important. And ultimately, the Secretary of Treasury decides um, what will be on the quarter. And in some cases, uh, the uh, the story that they're trying to convey is uh, is easier because there it is focused around one one thing. So for instance, for uh, Washington, uh, D.C., uh, the Frederick Douglass site is obviously centered around one historic person. Uh, it can be one famous scene. If you're doing Mount Hood, you know, you're going to be portraying Mount Hood. Uh, if you're, uh, you might be focused on one form of wildlife, like a uh, the night heron here that's uh, focused on for the Block Island uh, uh, site, uh, or one historic event. If you're doing Saratoga, no way around that you're going to be telling the story of the surrender uh, of the, uh, the, the army at Saratoga. So there are some parks for which that design, uh, the design choice is a little bit easier. And you can feel, think about different ways to convey each of those singular events, but much more challenging when you have a range of topics that you're trying to uh, convey and trying to decide which ones are most important to convey in the, in the quarter. Uh, got a couple of uh, examples here in some of the design selection process to share with you to give you a little bit of, uh, of an idea of how that uh, played out with a couple of the quarters. So we're Farm National Historic Site is in Connecticut. Um, it's honoring Julian Alden Weir, who was an impressionist painter. Um, Weir Farm is an interesting case to look at because there was so much conversation about it at the uh, Citizen Coinage Advisory Council meetings. There's just pages and pages and pages of transcripts. Um, and it, it made its appearance at two different meetings because they had to talk about it so much and go back and do redesigns. Um, and sometimes less is more when it comes to quarter design. And you'll notice that there's a blank canvas and that's really key um, to this quarter design. Um, the national park, the national site is, as I said, named after Julian Alden Weir, an impressionist painter. And the park is described as a singular crossroads of creativity, art and nature. So it's not just representing one thing, it's representing a lot of different things. And artists often travel to this park to experience um, the exquisite landscape that it offers and do some painting there on their own. Um, so what happened was they looked at the designs, they looked at the designs, they had to send everything back to designers. Um, discussions happened over and over again. They looked at a lot of detail in the designs. You go to the next slide. So they really looked at a lot of the detail in the designs and this was the ultimate um, deciding, decided design of the quarter. So they really looked at detail at this design. There was discussions about how the artist was holding the brushes and the palette and was that the correct way that an artist would hold brushes and a palette. They looked at the artist's clothing um, and one of the other options, the artist was wearing a short, shorter coat and it looked like just a suit jacket. And they said, no, it should be an artist smock. Um, some people feel felt that these coins should not have extra words on them, but for Weir Farm, this was especially important, and their representative said it was important that the wording be a national park for art put on this quarter because they did not want to be confused with a farm that would raise animals or crops. So in the end, they got the design that they wanted, and it's it's really a nice design, but again, Looking at those other options, you could see that maybe the painting did not really represent what Weir's paintings were with impressionistic painting. So they decided to go with a blank canvas. Uh, 
and I would say the Weir Farm, uh, it's one of my favorites. Uh, it, it's it's really cool. And it's a great site to visit, uh, too. Uh, one of the other uh, sites that had some uh, some design challenge to it, uh, not a lot of controversy, but some challenge, is uh, for South Dakota. Uh, here is the state quarter, and this depicts Mount Rushmore. Uh, it has the ring-necked pheasant there, the, the, the uh, ears of wheat as well. Um, some controversy, mild controversy when the state quarter came out. South Dakota has one of the largest uh, populations of Native Americans in the country. Uh, and there is just not a single bit of this design that is that sort of speaks uh, of something native to the United States. The ring neck pheasant comes from uh, Asia, uh, is imported. Those uh, ears of weed are a Eurasian crop that ends up mostly replacing the grassland of South Dakota. And of course, the, the sacred Lakota hills uh, are not depicted as the, the uh, uh, sacred Black Hills, uh, but rather the sculpture that's there done by the son of uh, Danish uh, immigrants and depicting, you know, Euro. American uh, presence that are there. So um, interesting that there isn't there isn't you know a lot of any of the that that Native American story that's portrayed there in the in the state. But um, you know largely a successful design. When the Mount Rushmore is uh, determined as the national park uh, site for the American the Beautiful quarter, well now what do you do? Do you do you put essentially the same view? You know that's the classic view of Mount Rushmore as you would see it as a as a visitor. How else might you be able to to represent that? So these are some of the design choices that came up and you see the uh, upper left one, one the uh, SD01 does in fact do that uh, and that is the you know the the the, the view uh, well it's probably from a drone <laughs> uh, but view looking head on at uh, the Mount Rushmore uh, heads here you do have a little more of the context of those sacred black hills so that that is uh, cool to see uh, and then in the bottom right you have uh, the maquette the the sort of sculptural uh, model that is uh, I think it's in the visitor center now uh, that was done uh, there. Um, uh, some have said this looks like a you know, lot of men waiting for something, uh, <laughs> but um, uh, there are two really interesting designs that are really perspective shifting. And those are the ones that highlight the work the, and the workers that are creating this monumental piece of sculpture uh, in the SD02 and SD03. Uh, and it's interesting looking at the, the two of those that uh, the one ultimately chosen would be SD03. I think the, the two, if you look at it it, it, it it almost looks like, what are all those things hanging off of Jefferson's face? I think there's something about the angularity of the cable and the singularity of that, that really does highlight that worker working on the finishing touches for, for Jefferson's face and a really kind of exquisitely done profile for, uh, for Washington as well. And this is ultimately the design that's chosen. Uh, I think I said the CCAC uh, uh, thought that the, the, uh, the four faces, uh, there was the, uh, ought to be the winning design, but this is the one selected. And it really is a, a, a beautiful coin. And, and it is one of my favorites as well. Uh, and that it, I'm partially maybe because coming from Lowell, the importance of work and workers here, that's really front and center in, in this design. This also won a coin of the year award for best circulating coin. So uh, others, others like it as well. So there are other kinds of controversies that come up with uh, with other sites that are a little uh, a little more challenging, uh, and this is one that results in a uh, in a coinage uh, kerfuffle. That seems like it should be a hashtag hashtag coinage kerfuffle. Uh, so this is the uh, site for Pennsylvania. Many will recognize this landscape as uh, Gettysburg National Military Park. Uh, the park really want, did not want the design to be uh, a generic cannon in a field, right? And, and it could be any Civil War uh, battlefield park, but wanted to have distinctive elements of the landscape represented. So here you do have the, uh, the Emmitsburg Road that is there, the uh, Kadori Barn in the distance that ends up uh, being important both during the battle and afterwards for use as a, uh, as a hospital. So help telling that landscape story in, in Gettysburg. And ultimately, this is the design that they did choose. The monument is the part that became a, a little controversial. This is the second, 72nd Pennsylvania uh, Infantry. Uh, and that monument is placed right at the edge of the stone wall. It's the, the high, near the high water mark, the, where Pickett's Charge ends. Uh, and it's where the 72nd unit found itself towards the end of the third day. But initially, they were further back. It's where they suffered their uh, heaviest losses. And there's some debate over the, wh whether they may have um, refused orders to move forward to repel the charge uh, and ended up hanging back. 
uh, and but ultimately ending ending up uh, moving forward and helping to repel that charge. That was such a debatable thing that when it came time for the unit's veteran organization to place the monument in the uh, late 19th century, they had to sue the Gettysburg Battlefield Mon Memorial Association, who refused putting this monument there because they said, no, you, you, know, you refuse to move forward and your greatest losses were furthest back. Your monument belongs elsewhere. Well, the 72nd wins their lawsuit. They get the monument placed in a somewhat petty move. The Gettysburg uh, Battlefield Memorial Association wants to put up a separate monument saying we had nothing to do with the location of this. They ultimately don't do that. And this ends up where it is in the battlefield. And it is now one of the most photographed monuments that is there on the battlefield and becomes the, the design for the, uh, the quarter. And I think it really does make a, a great design. The other great feature is that barn, the Kadori barn. As far as we know, it is the only depiction of a barn on a coin. Uh, and it is a Pennsylvania bank barn, uh, a disappearing architectural uh, remains of uh, you know, the, uh, the agricultural story of, of that area. Uh, and so great to tell that preservation story too. Just like the old man of the mountain, though, uh, this comes out, the quarter comes out in 2011, 2013, a windstorm comes along and what happens blows the monument right off of the, uh, the top there. So unlike the old man of the mountain that they can't rebuild, they do get this reset and uh, the following year it is back in place and uh, I iconically representing the park uh, and people can hold up their quarter right next to it and, and take a photo of that uh, on site. So one more controversy to highlight. Uh, uh, here uh, around American Samoa. Yep, so the American Samoa Quarter um, was released in 2020. Um, original designs that were looked at were the threadfin butterfly fish, um, an underwater scene representing the real natural beauty of American Samoa, and then another design representing the human element um, with an American Samoan blowing into a conch shell and the native trees um, behind that person there. Um, but ultimately, the design that was selected was the Samoan fruit bat. And this was exciting because it was a mother and her pup. I learned last night from Dave that baby bats are called pups. <laughs> um, I learned that just a minute before I shared it with Ellen. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this was great because this would be the first time that a bat was represented on a quarter and everybody was very excited about it. And everyone thought coin collectors would be excited about this too, representing a new form of wildlife on these quarters. Um, so the little bit of conspiracy is that this was released in early 2020. And we all know what happened in March of 2020, COVID-19. Um, there were some theories that maybe this came from the wet markets in Wuhan, China, and maybe it was spread from bats to humans whatever, it's all debatable, but who knows. Um, but it was interesting at the time that this quarter was released, it was the first time I was really seeing this quarter program mentioned in national news organizations. I started seeing it everywhere, even People Magazine. But then I realized what they were writing about. They were writing about it as a controversy, like why would the Mint put a bat at this time when we're dealing with COVID-19? Why would they put a bat on a quarter? This, this is terrible. Um, but it was interesting to see that it made national news. Um, Interestingly enough, um, we all know that design selection happens several years before the quarter is released. So it really had nothing to do with COVID, nothing to do with anything at the time that was happening in 2020. But like with the uh, old man of the mountain that, you know, it's meaning changes, right, as, as that falls off. It's interesting to see that once you get these designs out into the world, um, you kind of can't, you lose control of what they mean, right? You know, all, a whole lot of work goes into figuring out what the design ought to be, but then how the public perceives it and how that meaning changes, you can't control. It's one of the challenging things, but also one of the really cool things that these are out there and uh, they're, they're sort, of, sort of living because their meaning constantly, uh, you know, has the opportunity to change. So then we get to our Lowell design, and this is the one obviously that we know best. And for Lowell National Historical Park, there were 18 designs presented to the Citizen Coinage Advisory Council in September of 2017. Um, some of them were variations, so there were basically 11 distinct design concepts. Um, the CCAC, as most of you know, um, they vote on the different designs. And there was a lot of conversation about the different designs that were represented here. And this was the choice of the Citizen Coinage Advisory Council. It's lovely, but 
not quite what we were thinking. <laughs> um, it's artistically beautiful and it really shows the technology of the water power that turns the machines in the mills and it makes thread on the other side. The thread is what's in the shuttle. Um, the shuttle is what goes back and forth in a loom to actually create the cloth and textiles that were created here in Lowell. Um, it was, as I said, it was nice, but it was not quite the realistic um, worker and it was a little more fantastical of the magic of the water turning into thread. So then the Commission of Fine Arts met the next day and they chose this design. And this was the, our preferred design as well. Um, there were a few other top contenders, including this design, which is similar, but different um, from the chosen design. This shows two mill workers. And I, I really liked this design for a while because I really thought that it showed how the mill girls would learn things. And there was an older mill girl teaching a younger mill girl. And that's exactly what happened here in the mills of Lowell as more mill girls came in from the farms um, of New England, they would have a kind of a mentor, a mill girl that had been there a while teaching her. Um, but this design, also did not have the top of the clock tower, which I really feel makes our clock tower our clock tower. And I can see that clock tower right outside my window here. <laughs> um, and that's the historic um, shuttle weather vane at the top of the clock tower. So it didn't have that um, going for it, but it was a nice design. Another design was this option. Um, Lowell's kind of sometimes slogan is called City of Spindles because there were so many mills here and machinery. Um, with the Industrial Revolution that made the city of spindles. Um, and it's a great representation of a mill girl working at this certain machine and the technology. But some people thought the complexity of that machine would get a little bit muddled in the actual sculpting of the quarter. So in the end, this was our chosen design. Dave is going to tell us more about this design. Yeah, and we are very excited to have this uh, ultimately selected by the, the Secretary of the Treasury. It is, as Helen uh, pointed out, it, it was our preferred design. And I think it really, what I talked about earlier about trying to capture the diversity and the breadth of, uh, of any part story is a real challenge, but we thought this did this just uh, in, in a really excellent way. Um, first, I uh, just want to acknowledge um, the, the, the creators of this design. And, and I, I think it's, it, it is really neat that the initials of both the designer and the sculptor end up included on, uh, on these coins. So there they are, J.I. and P.H. and uh, J.I. Joel Iskowitz, one of the uh, uh, previous members of the uh, Mint's Artistic Infusion uh, program, uh, came up with the, the design that, uh, that um, as I said, is, is it just, just great in capturing what Lowell is about. We'll talk about those elements in a moment. Uh, and then of course, uh, Phoebe Hemphill, uh, many of you will be familiar with her work, uh, has done uh, uh, a lot of designs herself, but uh, a lot of the sculpting and the engraving. Um, Ellen just had the opportunity to uh, communicate with Phoebe and Phoebe talked about one of the great challenges in this design was trying to get the machinery right trying to figure out you know does this does it does it look right and does it does it look like it would do what it's supposed to do and how do i get the placement of the hands just right one of the earlier designs the uh, ccac conversation was around a mill girl who was sort of just kind of holding the the machine had her hands sort of lightly resting on it that looked like she was presenting the machine but not working on it but here we have you know somebody clearly working on it and it was very important that we convey that story of uh, story of work so just to, to hit on uh, some of what makes this one of the really, I think, the, the ideal uh, design is that it does illustrate the, uh, the, the whole factory city, the mills that are just out the window. Uh, as uh, Alan had mentioned, this is the boot uh, clock uh, clock boot mill clock tower uh, that you can see from, uh, from most places in the park and out Ellen's window. At the top of it is that shuttle that is the weather van, a shuttle like this. This is what would be sent back and forth in looms to weave the cloth. It's one of the iconic uh, parts of the landscape that we, that we often point out uh, the, the architecture to, to people that are visiting. But it also captures the change in power source that we go from using water power to later steam power. And there's one of the great smokestacks that's now filled throughout the city. In fact, if you look out the, you know, throughout the city through much, much of the end of the 19th century and the 20th century, what defines it is the smoke coming out of all of those chimneys. Uh, and many of those chimneys are, those smokestacks are still there today. They decorate them for the holidays. So it's a really emblematic part of what the, um, uh, the city, is, uh, city is about. 
Uh, and uh, the other story that it tells is this Booth Boot, uh, Mills clock tower was preserved by the park. When the park was established, it helped uh, you know, turn a lot of the city around, including preserving some of these great architectural reminders of the, the, the park's industrial age. So it conveys a little bit of the preservation story as well. Uh, on top of the, uh, those elements, we have the story of technology. This is the Northrop bobbin, bobbin battery. It automatically changes the bobbins and the machines, and it revolutionizes the textile industry. It makes it more efficient, more uh, speedy, uh, much more productive, uh, ends up with much more profits in the hands of the uh, mill workers, but ends up in, in employing um, you know, additional uh, uh, machinists and mechanics to, to do a lot of the work in, in fixing it. So this is, uh, this sort of is an indicator of the importance of innovation and technology in our story. And you can see that today, that bobbin battery attached to our 1913 Draper looms that are in on the, uh, on the main uh, weave room floor uh, at the boot cotton mills. So just one of the great things we thought people would be holding up this quarter, just like the Gettysburg Monument, that they'd hold it up and say, there it is. Here they can hold it up and say, there, there it is as well. Uh, but not only there it is technology-wise, this is also oops, um, uh, a story of the human story. And this is probably the most important story that we tell, right? The story of uh, work and the story of the workers. Here's a great shot of the courtyard of the boot mills with hundreds of the workers gathered out and the, and, and the pride that they had in, in, in putting themselves on display and taking a photo of being connected to this, uh, you know, to the in industrial mill. Uh, Many of those workers come from uh, elsewhere as well. So I talked about the immigrants coming uh, earlier and, and lending uh, their uh, uh, culture to the tremendous diversity of the city. So it's definitely something that we wanted to highlight. And one of the features of Lowell National Historical Park is you can see workers at work. There are 88 looms in the boot mills uh, at, in the weave room, and we often have them all running creating a tremendous clatter and noise. You can feel the vibration. You can get a sense of what working in a place like that might have been uh, with our very skilled uh, 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 mill workers uh, attending to the machines there. Uh, so you can see exactly the scene that you, that you, um, that you, that you see in the, in the quarter. So all of those together and just sculpted beautifully by, by Phoebe Hemphill, uh, we thought this is just sort of the perfect representation of uh, of the park and, and all of its themes as a whole. And, and, and very, very pleased that, uh, that uh, the governor, the National Park Service director, uh, the park superintendent, uh, and ultimately the secretary of the treasury and, uh, agreed, with, uh, agreed with that. Some, some really beautiful designs, but, but we really think this is, uh, this is perfect. Uh, so with the design figured out, the next step with all of these quarters is getting it out into the world and doing, uh, doing the quarter launch. So we've got a couple of different quarter launches that uh, Ellen will talk about here. Yep, as Dave said, the, the quarters need to get out there to do the good work that they were intended to do, speaking of work. <laughs> um, so every site has handled their coin launch a little bit differently. Um, just wanted to show you a couple of examples of what other sites have done. Um, when planning our coin launch, we were, as I said, the 46th out of 56 coins. So we had the benefit of learning what other sites had done before us in 2019 here in Lowell. So, you know, we looked at um, past scripts that they had, past um, every site picked different presenters, every site picks different um, entertainment for their launch. Every site picks a different way to actually launch their quarter into circulation. But the common theme running through all of these is that young people would be at these sites. Um, again, to inspire the next generation, not just of coin collectors, but inspire the next generation to really look at these coins and understand their history and their significance that maybe they want to visit these sites or learn more about these sites. So what happens at each quarter launch is anyone under age 18 gets a quarter. And so that's why it was very important for the Mint that school groups, um, school children get included in the, the coin launch um, for each site. So American Samoa was in February of 2020. It was the last big event that the Mint was able to have um, on site before COVID shut everything down. But you can see they brought in their, their quarters on a boat and launched them that way. So there's children there and everybody was very excited. Um, another launch was the next slide at the Theodore Roosevelt site. 
again, launching the quarters into circulation. Lots of people showed up in North Dakota in August of 2016. You can see the crowds there. And Teddy Roosevelt himself was able to be there, which was quite remarkable. <laughs> So with, with uh, as Ellen said, we really benefited from, from having some idea of what uh, previous um, uh, launches were like. And so we started figuring out what, you know, what are we going to do to launch, uh, launch the Lowell Quarter? Uh, and uh, we uh, uh, started to plan. And one of the things, because the park is so much a community park, the, the idea for Lowell National Historical Park really springs from the community and community advocates getting it established in the 1970s as a way after the uh, industry left in the 1950s, the city was in pretty rough shape. And it, and it was it was a way of bringing that sense of pride back to the city, but also bringing some federal money to help uh, preserve the city and restore it and help revitalize it. So the community is such an important part of who the park is. We often say the park is the city, the city is the park. And so so whatever we did had to be rooted in the community. And we started getting the community excited with uh, our annual City of Lights Parade. You can see uh, here we are uh, with a, a very large quarter, uh, you know, walking through the, uh, the, the streets of uh, Lowell, uh, people cheering us on. And this was such an exciting thing to be a, a part of. And again, the, you know, that sense of community pride really, really, uh, you, you could feel it uh, uh, in, in the energy of the, of the crowds there. So uh, a lot of energy around getting uh leading up to the to the quarter launch our launch is set for february 6th of 2019 so uh invitations uh, would go out from the men for people to attend we lined up a venue the lowell memorial auditorium traditionally where lowellians go to celebrate big events uh it holds a few thousand people so we imagined several thousand people that would be uh in attendance that day started lining up uh the the uh, uh high school uh, bands and chorus and and uh, uh, lots of students. We plan to bring all of the fourth grade students here to, to be part of the launch. Uh, and we'd end up with, I think, 1,400 students. So we're planning this really, really big event that, again, is so rooted in the community. Some of you may remember that uh, that time period. Uh, and if you're a government worker, you certainly remember it because uh, there we are, February 6, uh, 2019, is the intended launch. Uh, and what happens in December of 2018? So that is the government shutdown. And when the government shuts down, many government employees cannot work. So the U.S. Mint, because they get their money from different places, they're allowed to work, but the National Park Service is not. Uh, Ellen at the Songs Industrial History Center, she is allowed to work, but not in her usual place and in her offices. And she really can't communicate with any of the National Park Service staff, including me, uh, as the liaison with the men to, to try to get this event um, um, underway. And it is a big event. Uh, shut down on December 22nd, and time just goes by. Uh, weeks and weeks and weeks, and some concern, is this event going to even be possible? January 25th, we had a meeting and all but determined that, you know, it's just, it's too close. This is not an event that we're going to be able to do. On the afternoon of January 25th, the president meets in the Rose Garden and announces that the uh, uh, negotiations have resulted in uh, a successful reopening of the government. The government will reopen the next day. Very quickly, a flurry of activity and calls, uh, what turned into one of the saddest days, I think Ellen and I's you know, life <laughs> turns into a, a both a happy day, but a very stressful day because now we have just a week and a half to pull off this, this massive uh, event. But the team pulls together, uh, you know, and uh, really great credit to everybody at Lowell National Historical Park and to all of our partners, the, the banks, the schools, uh, all of those members of the community really coming together to help us out put on this, uh, this great event. And so fast forward just a week and a half, and here we are uh, on the big day at the start of our event. I'll let uh, Ellen take it away from you. Yep, so, so it was a wonderful day, and we were just so excited. And as Dave said, the team just pulled together, and there was so much anticipation throughout the city because the community really we're excited about this because it doesn't just say Lowell National Historical Park on the quarter. It says Lowell. So the city of Lowell was really behind this um, anticipation of the big day. There we are setting up and the buses started to pull up with all our 1400 fourth graders from across the city. So it was just bus after bus after bus and they all got let in by our staff here. 
and we filled the auditorium. So it all worked wonderfully. Um, we had the Lowell High ROTC as our color guard. We had the Lowell High Chorus who sang the national anthem. We had the Lowell High Band there who played a specially commissioned um, piece of music called Mills Along the Merrimack. And that was really special because we were able to show a movie behind them um, all about the Mill Girls. So we incorporated a lot of the history that's represented on the coin into that day for all of these students. Um, we had a lot of dignitaries gather. We had a number of different speakers. Um, we featured a lot of women leaders from across the country because a woman is featured on this quarter. So we had former Congresswoman Nikki Sangas, um, regional director of the Park Service, our own National Park Superintendent, um, and different community leaders. Um, Mark Landry, who was former deputy director of the Mint, was able to join us from Washington. So that was great. And they presented the formal presentation plaque that day, which was really great to see. Uh, and then, and then the uh, big moment. Yes. Uh, so, uh, so this is the dramatic moment where the coin is actually launched out in into the world, as we said earlier, to do that good work that these coins uh, uh, do. And every park has come up with something uh, a, a little bit different, but something symbolic and connecting to the stories of the park. So we uh, we thought a lot on this, and we ended up coming up with some, uh, a, I think, a really cool uh, coin pour. A couple of the elements here. So this is a water wheel. This is used at the Songus Industrial History Center with all the school uh, kids. Uh, some years, up to 50,000 kids come through school programs there, uh, and they learn about the technology of the mills and the building of water wheels and turbines and, and the canal system. So this is one of those water wheels, and it's uh, historically what would have powered the mill. So connecting to that uh, technology story. Uh, some of the brick, right? So you see brick all throughout the city. It's one of its identifying features, those um, uh, the, the brick mills. Uh, and then the coins are going to be poured into the hopper, which I'll say, this is our section that represents the community. Because remember, we only had a week and a half to put this together. And so we were just trying really hard to get everything together and did not have a hopper for the top. Uh, one of our great community partners runs a coffee shop down the street said, hey, I've got this great salad bowl that would look the part. Uh, and so indeed, that's what we have as the, uh, the the hopper in the top in the park there. So cool to see you know, so that those community um, connections sort of uh, part of this as well. The coins will come through the hopper down through the water wheel and then be sent down into this trunk. This traveling trunk uh, is something that one of the, uh, the park rangers, uh, his great aunt's ancestor came from Lithuania around the turn of the 20th century, brought this trunk with her. So this tells the story of people coming here looking for opportunity, just like so many of the workers did coming to the textile mills. And then finally, it is lined with the cloth made in the mill. Still today at the Bukhan Mills, those looms are creating cloth that we have available in our gift shop, but we used to tell the story uh, of the, the manufacture of cloth. So really a tremendous, um, uh, tremendous tremendously symbolic opportunity for those dignitaries to pour the coins in and get the coin launched. So I've got about a 45 second video just to show, uh, show you this. And what I want you to listen for, uh, there are 2,800 people in attendance and about 1,400, about half of them are school kids. And we didn't plan this, didn't cue them, but just to hear the cheers erupt as the coins are poured in is one of the, you know, the coolest moments I think that either Ellen or I have, uh, have experienced. So let me, uh, I'll get that, uh, video started for you here. <laughs> Oops, sorry.
Uh, so again, just a, a really cool experience to be part of. And even when I watch it now, I've seen it a bunch of times. I'm still moved by that because it's such a, a moment to be a part of. And that all of the community is there and uh, and, and really invested in, in this idea. And they will remember being a, a, a part of that forever. It's one of the great lasting legacies of the quarter. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that as we get towards the end of the presentation. Uh, a lot of other uh, great things going on here. The, uh, the, the quarter is uh, in uh, there. You can see a little corner of that boot mills cloth uh, up in the right-hand uh, side there. Uh, we, uh, again, all about the future generations, right? Handing a quarter out. Everybody 18 and, and, and uh, under got a quarter there. And remember, there are thousands of people there. So being handed out by uh, uh, Deputy Director uh, Landry and, and some of the park uh, service uh, folks there. Uh, great to be able to get those in the hands of all the school kids with this cool little uh, case that the, the, the Mint provided us. Uh, so a little memento and keepsake to remember their part in this. The uh, coin exchange, uh, something like 20, 25,000 thousand dollars changed hands and people getting their rolls of, uh, of low quarters and uh, partnering with the, uh, the the banks and doing this. This is one of our longtime supporters in the park, the uh, local bank uh, that was founded to provide banking opportunities to uh, workers in the, in the mills. The um, uh, And there some of those rolls are. Uh, and then uh, we had a, a living history portrayal of a mill girl. So uh, one of our staff dressed up uh, just as the mill girl in the uh, in the quarter, holding up this quarter and sort of proudly being part of this experience. Um, I don't know, Ellen, you want to share the identity of this mill girl? <laughs> that mill girl is my daughter. <laughs> so she did a great job. I remember it was so fun picking out her what she would wear and Doing her hair was all Doing her a good hair, part of so the great day. Match there, yes, and enough so that people thought was she was she the model for the for the quarter there. <laughs> so uh, just a, a really uh, a really cool uh, uh, experience there, and, and a tremendous thing to be a, a part of there. And uh, we, we touched on these a little bit, but I think that that uh, in our last part, just want to talk about some of the lasting benefits, the legacy, how important these. Uh, uh, the idea of this America the Beautiful Quarter series is and the, and the lasting benefits that it has. Yep, so just real briefly, we'll go through those, the park awareness of these different historic sites, um, introducing park enthusiasts to the numismatic world, um, increasing visitation to parks, educational opportunities, and community pride. And we'll just touch on those in our last couple of minutes. So 328 million Lowell quarters are out there. And I always love it when I hear from people across the country, friends and family, oh, I found one. And it's great to know that so many of them are out there. And it really shows um, that these little quarters can make a difference in getting people excited about a site. The other unique thing that happened um, for us was Lowell National Historical Park was the first quarter to be minted with the W um, mint mark on it. And that's for the West Point. That's where it was minted. Um, Two million of those were minted. And what was exciting about that was that they got mixed in with other quarters that were produced by the mint at that time. So that people had, and it encouraged people to really look through their change and find some of those W quarters and they're out there. We have uh, merchandise that was created so people could get a, a, a mug, a tote bag, a, a trivet uh, celebrating the quarter. And now all of those things are out there sort of building awareness of the park. Uh, people move away, people come and go, but still they'll have these things and, and, and it'll be intriguing to people and will help uh, you know raise the profile of both our uh, park at, at Lowell, but uh, but the, the idea of the national parks and the sort of the breadth of the stories they tell in, in, in general. Uh, increasing visitation, really hard to measure this, but we know that there are a lot of people out there specifically visiting quarter national parks. Uh, we have one of them among us uh, today. Uh, so yeah, so that is so that is a, a kind of a, something like I said that we, that we can't measure, but knowing people are out there and uh, uh, checking us because we're on the quarter, but also now that they're aware of us, main it's not you know we're not the Yellowstone or, or Yosemite. People don't not necessarily know about us from other places in the country, but now having seen us on the quarter, like hey, when we're out there, we've got to check that national park out. It is the one that represents Massachusetts. So these are some of the scenes of uh, visitors visiting our park in various different ways. If you have not visited a little national store. Park, I would encourage you to uh, encourage you to do that. Uh, we do have one visitor uh, here, and so we have this in our visitor center where you can put your face in the um, uh, in the uh, quarter there and, and take your picture and uh, hashtag us and get that out in the world. Uh, and again, Alan, would you like to share the identity of this? Uh, 
This individual. Or this individual is my grandson, and he really enjoys visiting Lowell National Historical Park. <laughs> As everybody should. So, so super, super cute there. So, yeah. Um, so, a lot of other benefits too. Uh, yep. Another lasting benefit. Uh, is, uh, educational opportunities. Yep. Another lasting benefit is the educational opportunities. And that's especially near and dear to me working here at the Songus Industrial History Center and the school groups that we see. But it really opened up. Um, for us to tell a national story about our park. Um, the Mint created different things on their website, including textile tales. Um, this was all created by the Mint. And it's just a, a game that you can play with Pinky the pig as a mill girl. And Pinky joins their friends Flip and Goldie, um, portraying different characters that are part of the Lowell story. So that's a fun thing on their website. Um, also, they created with each site um, curriculum for teachers. And I, I always encourage teachers local and from far away to use this curriculum because it's a great way for students to learn not just about our site but about sites across the country so quarters are a great way to learn that uh and finally one of the the i think the great lasting benefits of this is that that sense of community pride that it that it instills it is you know this this is a hometown national park and this is true across the country people that are uh have a national park nearby and have an opportunity to participate in an event like this they will remember that uh, forever and when they run across a quarter that has that park on it five years from now, 10 years from now, 20, 30 years from now, uh, they can sort of wax nostalgic and think about, you know, I was there when this was launched out in, into the world. Something that they can share with that, that the next generation of coin collectors or just people that have a, 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 an interest in the quarter. Uh, and looking out here, you know, so much of what the Mint does is about the future generations. And here they are. This is the, the next generation all here, all you heard them cheering and, and, and clapping, all had a quarter in their uh, in their hand. So it's just great to think that they've been a part of this. And who knows what coin collectors we might inspire, what people that are interested in, in, in design and sort of thinking about what goes on these quarters or what people are inspired to, to think more about and visit more of the national parks. So this, I think, is one of the great, you know, lasting benefits and legacies of, of, of this whole program. And I'm super excited to have been a, a part of it. I can say it's one of the, you know, the proudest thing, the things that I'm proudest of in my entire NPS career, um, and truly an honor to work with um, uh, Ellen as, as such a great partner in, uh, in putting this event on. So, Yep, truly one of the highlights of my career as well, and we really enjoyed working on this. Um, just brought so many great people together, and it was just, in general, fun. So thank you. Um, and uh, thank you so much. Uh, and there are some of our websites. You can uh, check out the park, check out the Songus Industrial History Center. Uh, and of course, many of you will be familiar with the, the website for the U.S. Mint. Uh, so again, thank you. That is our, our presentation. But uh, I think we've got a, a few minutes uh, left here. If anybody has any questions, happy to, to answer them for you. Leon, I think you're muted. There we go. Now we we're should just, be able to hear me. We're Sorry very about quiet. that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so we will do the Q and A now. Uh, we do have more people watching online than we have in the room, so we're going to start with some questions over Zoom. Um, just go ahead and send those in with that Q and A button in Zoom, and we'll go around. We don't have a ton of time left. We do have to wrap it up at eleven fifteen Central, um, so we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, so the one we have in here, was there any discussion about who should be producing the designs, such as the debate about sculptors versus illustrators? So, as we said, it was the um, artistic infusion program that the Mint has, and there was some discussion here early on in Lowell specifically, like Lowell is a big artist community as well, so there was a little bit of discussion, would artists, local artists be insulted that they weren't invited to be part of the design process, but we had to just go with what the Mint um, has in place with their artistic infusion program artists, um, designers, and then the design gets passed on to the sculptors. All right. Um, let's see, did AI play a role in the design of the quarters? No, I think this was before, for us anyway, this was before AI was a big deal. So as far as I know, no. 
-hmm. I'm going to try that though. I'm going to go to chat GPT and type in, you know, Lowell National Historical Park quarter design and, and see what, see what they come up with there. But yeah, so <laughs> this is, yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, that's the last one that we have in here for now. Um, we have had a couple people just sending in comments saying thank you, and it was very informative. So thank you both. Um, if we don't have anything else come in in the next couple minutes, uh, we will wrap it up. Um, for everyone watching, remember all of the presentations are recorded. So if there are any that you missed that you want to view later, um, they will be up on the NNP about two weeks from the end of the symposium on Saturday. As long as you are registered, which everyone watching should be, uh, you will get an email when those are up, or you can check back on the symposium website, and there'll be a little banner at the very top of the page announcing when the recordings are up. So thank you, everyone watching at home and here, and to Ellen and David for taking the time out to present. Uh, next up, we will have Mark Burkhart starting at 1130 Central. So hope you all will join us back for that one. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. And uh, thank you all.